Thank you, guys. Well, friends, our gospel reading today on this second Sunday of Easter comes from John, from the 20th chapter, and we'll read verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. So, uh, this is the story of Doubting Thomas. I've always thought Thomas gets a really bad rap here. You know, he wasn't there the first time Jesus appears in the room to the other disciples. And so, as far as he knows, Jesus is dead. And then the others all say, oh, we've seen him. And he thinks that they're pulling his leg and trying to trick him. And because of that, for 2,000 years, the poor guy's been called Doubting Thomas. And we don't call Peter lying Peter, although we probably should. But Thomas gets stuck with this uh, doubting Thomas business. It's really not fair. Thomas is the guy who makes the single uh, clearest, most declarative statement about who Jesus is in the entire New Testament. He says of Jesus, my Lord and my God. Nobody else says anything like that to Jesus except Thomas. And of course, uh, through history, you, you may know the, there's this place where history becomes legend and legend becomes myth. And in the midst of all of that, you find the story of when Europeans were setting off in their sailing ships in the 1500s and 1600s and colonizing uh, the world. And a group of them showed up in India, got off their boat, wandered into the local town, found there was nobody there in any of the houses. Why not? It's because they're all at church. So they naturally enough assumed that some other group of Europeans had got there. Maybe the French got there first, or the Spanish, or the Portuguese, or the Brits. And the locals said, no, 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 we've always been here. They said, what do you mean always? They said, we've been here since the time of Jesus. Why? Because Thomas came, they said. And he told us about Jesus. And we've been here ever since. It's a great story. I don't know whether it's true or not, but you know, we have a, a family who's part of our church who are from India. They know what they knew that story when I started talking about it the first time, and they were like, oh, yes, yes, that's where we're from. We know that. So much for doubting Thomas, then, the guy that carries the faith to an entire subcontinent on his own shoulders. So um, the problem with the story of Doubting Thomas is that people like to yank it out of its context. And when you look at it just by itself, 
it's easy to paint Thomas in this kind of slightly dodgy light as someone who doesn't trust, not kind of suspicious of the idea that Jesus has really come back from the dead. So if you put it back into its original context, though, you discover it's part of a much bigger story and you shouldn't take it out on its own. So let's do that. Let's put it back. Story starts at the beginning of Genesis. You'll recall God creates and gives life. And then in John's Gospel, we have the account of the resurrection. God recreates and gives new life. They're parallel stories. In the very beginning of the story in Genesis, the chapter starts with the words, in the beginning. And then there's a, a whole lot of stuff that talks about light and darkness and keeping light and darkness separating them and keeping light and darkness apart and it ends with a reference to the evening and the morning and the first day and then you go to john's gospel and you discover it starts with exactly the same words in the beginning there's a lot of talk about light shining in the darkness and the darkness not overcoming it in other words keeping them separate and the passage we just read in john 20 talks about when it was evening on that day the first day of the week I put it to you that these two stories are supposed to be parallels to each other, right? It would be hard to miss this. In the first story, the Genesis story, when people get involved, is when people get involved that it all starts going wrong, right? We have the story of Adam and Eve and then other stories as well. And in the story of Adam and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden, everything's paradise, and then it all starts to kind of crumble apart in the story. And it crumbles apart amidst confusion and doubt and fear and these very human emotions. And the whole thing just kind of unravels within a few pages. And then in John's Gospel, we saw how at the time of the resurrection, the time of new creation and new life, we had Mary Magdalene show up at the, at the tomb, discover it's empty, and it's an exercise in confusion. What does she think? She thinks somebody's taken his body and put it somewhere else. That's what it happens in the story maybe body snatches when the resurrected jesus appears to her she thinks he's the gardener remember it's 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 all about confusion and then this week we have jesus appearing to thomas in the middle of doubt and of course jesus appears to the other disciples who have shut themselves up because of fear so um this story is really about the complex interaction of confusion, doubt, and fear, these very human emotions, and what those can do to us in, a, in an encounter with God here, an encounter with the one who is my Lord and my God. And all of these elements are present in each scenario in John's Gospel. And it turns out that um, if you were to ask me, what would you do about a situation in which there's a lot of confusion? My response would be to say, well, if confusion is the problem, then clarity is the solution. That's what I would want. And if doubt is the problem, then certainty would be the solution. And if fear is the problem, I would say to you that fearlessness is the solution. The biblical narrative disagrees with me on every point here, all possible points. So um, if confusion is the problem, is clarity the solution? No, that's, no, no, no. Because you're never gonna get it, is what the biblical narrative says. The search for clarity goes on forever. The more you understand one thing, the less you understand something else. And so clarity is always elusive. And so we read over and over again in the biblical narrative things like God is not a God of confusion. God is a God of not clarity, peace. How do you learn to live at peace in the midst of things that are very confusing, right? Why is it then? You see, when Jesus shows up, what does he say? He doesn't say clarity be with you. He says peace be with you. Peace be with you. So peace, or as you know, what Jesus really would have said is shalom, which is not just peace as the absence of conflict, it's peace as in wholeness, completeness, contentment, all of those things. How do you learn to be like that when things are very, very confusing? Clarity is not the solution. Peace, 
Shalom is the solution. And how about doubt? As we're talking about doubting Thomas, if doubt is the problem, is certainty the solution? Mm. Actually, when you read about doubt in the Bible, and the Bible has a lot to say about doubt, because presumably everybody has doubts about one thing or another, it talks about um, having mercy on those who doubt. So it says God has mercy on those who doubt. In other words, God understands about doubt. And in the story, we see that if God has mercy on us, God understands our doubts, we are called to trust that do not doubt but believe and remember belief here is belief as in the sense of trust or faith so if doubt is the problem it's okay god understands god has mercy and we are called to put a little bit of trust into god's mercy in this situation certainty mm, there's no suggestion that you're going to find that and fear when fear is the problem we might say, well, obviously, fearlessness would be the solution. But actually, as you probably know, the Bible has a lot to say about fear. You may have read in some little meme somewhere that, that, uh, that the Bible says, do not be afraid 365 times. It's, it's absolutely not true. But it's a lot. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Or like here in the Psalms. Whom shall I fear, it says. Whom shall I fear if the Lord is my light and salvation? Of whom shall I be afraid if the Lord is the stronghold of my life? Do not be afraid. I am your shield, says God. Do not be afraid. God has heard. Do not be afraid. I am with you, says God. If fear is the problem, then being at one with God is the solution that the Bible proposes. Not that you can generate fearlessness on your own, but by being at one with God, you can face fear. So, um, you'll notice in the story that John tells, the disciples are behind closed doors because they were frightened. It says, locked for fear of the Jews. That's one of those passages you have to be very careful with because uh, in John's Gospel, the expression, the Jews, simply means uh, the Jewish leaders of the temple not all jewish people jesus is jewish right this is not a condemnation of judaism it's it's a commentary on the nature of the people leaving the temple but the disciples are locked away because they're afraid and what's the solution to that my lord and my god comes and stands right with them that's what happens here the presence of god is the solution to the human condition of fear in this story so what have we got then? We've got a problem solution set up that doesn't look anything like the one that I would have constructed. Instead, it says if confusion is the problem, we're going to have to learn how to live at peace with that, how to be whole and complete in the presence of confusion. If doubt is the problem, it's okay. God understands that. God has mercy and calls for us to exhibit some elements of trust or belief. And if fear is the problem, Recognizing the presence of God is the solution. That's what the whole narrative is about. And you see, when you yank Thomas out of it, he looks a little strange and gets a funny name that lasts for 2,000 years, but he's really part of a much bigger picture. And the picture is all about the human condition. It's about you and me, it's what it's about. The reaction that people have when they're in a situation of confusion, doubt, and fear is almost always to try and block themselves away, lock themselves up, keep separate, right? Because everything's very confusing and you're frightened and you have lots of doubts and you don't know what to do. So what do you do? You get behind locked doors and close yourself in. Well, in the story, the guys have got themselves behind locked doors and they've closed themselves in and Jesus appears in the midst of them and says peace be with you and then he says as the father has sent me so i send you he's gonna send them out send them out from uh, behind these locked doors what we actually have here really really this is an upside down easter story you remember in the easter story i told you one of the things to learn from the story of the resurrection is you can't put god in a box 
just like they tried to put Jesus in a tomb and close it up with a big stone. Whenever we do that, we say, okay, I've got God under control now. God is in a box. I know the dimensions of the box. I know what God can and can't do. Everything's fine. I'm in a box. And then the Easter story says you open the box or you open the tomb, you look inside, and he's not there. He's outside in the garden talking to the most unlikely of people. In the story we read, he's talking to Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom um, one of the other Gospels says seven demons went out. So this is a very troubled individual here who was obviously very dear to Jesus. And when she looked in the tomb, he was not there. He was out. In this story, it's kind of the other way around. The the disciples, the people, have put themselves inside the box and closed the door, right? They went into a room and they locked it all up. And they thought, we're safe in here. Everything's going to be all right in here. And Jesus comes along, appears inside the box, even though there's no way to get in, opens the box and says, no, 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 no. You must go out. You must go out. You can't hide in here. And it's true. You can't hide from confusion and doubt and fear because they are everywhere. They're everywhere. You can't get away from it just by closing a door around behind you here. So this is a sort of inverted Easter story here. It's very cleverly done. And it's about new life in the sense of breaking out of the box of confusion and doubt and fear and moving ahead in a new way. New life, new creation breaking out of the box. So, in the midst of confusion, doubt, and fear, God shows up, bringing mercy and peace and saying, do not be afraid. And as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Opens the box and says, off you go. That's what happens in the story here. It's a very special inverted Easter story to show us what new life looks like. It's okay to be confused about things. It's okay to have doubts and it's okay to be afraid because we're just people. And our own solutions to these problems don't usually work. But when God shows up bringing mercy and peace and saying, do not be afraid, then you can open the box. Then you can go out, carry the good news, maybe all the way to India like Thomas did. Do something spectacular. 2,000 years later, people might still be talking about it. Who knows? God shows up bringing mercy and peace, saying, do not be afraid. Go. As the Father has sent me, so I send you.